Today, I'd like to examine with you a very simple question, which is what role can religion play in building peace? What role can religion play in building peace in Israel-Palestine? And to do that, I'd like to invite you to join me on a journey which will begin at, in the Old City at the Damascus Gate. The Damascus Gate is, you can see here, just uh, at the north part of the Old City. It's been the location of a site of protests and demonstrations over the recent years. It's a site of stabbings, shootings, fights, and arrests. And once again, this year, this Ramadan, the Damascus Gate has become a flashpoint uh, for fights between Palestinian um, and Israeli forces and people. The United Nations has warned that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is again reaching a boiling point. According to the BBC, this year, since uh, the beginning of the year, over 140 Palestinians have been killed and over 30 uh, Israelis. On the gate, this was just to go back to the gate, it was built under Suleiman the Magnificent in 1537. It was built on top of a Roman gate um, from the Emperor Hadrian's time, and it takes you into the, the Muslim quarter. You can see it's one of seven of the largest uh, accessible gates leading into the, uh, Jerusalem's old city. It has a long history of tension there. You can go back to 1938, and you can see here British forces searching for weapons. It's known in Arabic um, as the Gate of the Column, and the Jews know it as Nablus Gate. The Crusaders knew it as St. Stephen's Gate. Uh, recently, it's been called uh, Martyr's Gate. According to one Palestinian scholar, uh, it's, it has become a symbol for the Palestinian national struggle because of its accessibility to Palestinians and the main connecting point for both worshippers and for markets. This is a photo from earlier this year, um, and you can see here a fight between Palestinian and Jewish youths on a very controversial holiday that is celebrated by some Israelis um, on celebrating the capture of the old city in, during the 1967 Six Day War. Now, when we look at this photo, uh, we could do all sorts of things uh, with it as we reflect on it. And we could think about, we could step back for a moment and think about different theories about violence and religion. For example, this theory about the myth of redemptive violence. That's the myth that believes that. Um, that enshrines the belief that violence saves, that war brings peace, that might makes right, and it's one of the oldest continuously repeated stories in the world. Some people argue it's, it's deep in many people's bones. You cr in other words, you crush the opposition, and that's how we bring peace. Another way of looking at that picture, thinking about it, is where we could think about different relationships between religion and violence. Some people argue that religion is inherently violent, it drives violence, particularly monotheistic religions. There are other people who say, no, religion is peaceful and violence is an aberration. Or others suggest that religion contributes to mimetic conflict. What's meant by that is you, there's an imitator, you, you want something and we go for that and we desire that and that leads to mimetic conflict, rivalry and then finally sort of scapegoating. So we scapegoat another individuals uh, who are not necessarily in our group. And there are some who even argue that religion does not exist, uh, re sorry, religious violence does not exist. The myth of religious violence. And there are those who also argue that religion can both incite violence and promote peace. Different approaches, different theories. For example, Mark Copin, who's worked a lot in Israel-Palestine, suggests that religion can bring peace to the Middle East. Now, I am not going to spend this whole lecture examining those theories. I just want to put them there and let you think about them, because I want to go on a journey round the old city, and I'd like to meet with you a number of the different religious leaders. So bear the theories in mind, but just come with me for a moment. Before we go to Jerusalem, let's go to uh, Washington. Uh, this is the Council of Religious Institutions of the Holy Land meeting the then Vice President, Joe Biden. And this was the council that... Um, employed me, I worked with for a number of months 
uh, just before COVID. And what we, th they wanted uh, us to do was to bring together Jewish, Christian, Muslim religious leaders and Israeli and Palestinian journalists. So we got together uh, in different places. Uh, and particularly, memorably, because it was easiest, we actually went to the Netherlands together and talked there for a week. And I'll never forget, uh, at the end of the week, we had, you know, that sometimes you get together and you say, OK, how was the week? How was the conversation together? And we went around the entire room and people said, oh, it was very good because I've never met a Palestinian properly before except for uh, someone I'm scared, about, scared of. These were some leading Israeli journalists who said it's changing the way I'm going to cover this story. And others, say, others said, well, I, I've never met a Jewish journalist before or a Jewish rabbi before. And this is going to change how I think about it. So I was thinking, this is great. This is the end of this week's conversations. And then someone said, hang on a sec. And he stood up and he spoke in Hebrew and then in Arabic. And he said, I am just tired of these conversations. We go on talking, it normalizes things, and nothing changes. And he was furious. And then someone from the Israeli side stood up and said something similar back, sort of shouting. And I thought, oh no, this was the last hour of a week of conversations. I, I thought this is a disaster. Then this six-foot guy from uh, Bethlehem stood up and said, I'm feeling terrible about this. And I thought, well, I'm feeling terrible about this as well. He brought us down from about a 10 to a 7 in terms of the sort of anger in the room. But that was how it ended. And I remember cycling around, it was all uh, around uh, sort of the new part of Amsterdam, thinking, that was a disaster, a complete disaster. All that bridge building, all that peace building, uh, it was a failure. So after that, we went back to the occupied West Bank, went back to uh, East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, to Ramallah, to Tel Aviv, and talked to all the different individuals. And I said, how did you find the week? They said, oh, it was great. We learned so much. I was really pleased to do it. But you know, Jolene, the best part, the very best part for me, you know when it was? It was the last hour when we started telling the truth. And that stopped me. I thought, wow. Uh, because I like things tidy. I like things tidying up. I like them tidy. And that's why I put the theories up. You know, the th theories can tidy things up. But this is really messy. This is really, really ugly at times. And I am very much a learner there. I'm a guest there. I haven't lived there. I don't speak Arabic or Hebrew. And therefore, I am aware that I have a huge amount to learn. So as you listen to me, be aware of that. I am not claiming some amazing knowledge of this situation. This is based on a project and research that I've done there and my work there. So it's, it's limited. And I, do, I really don't want to overclaim. And that's why I'd like to invite you with me to uh, revisit um, the old city. And the old city, I really like, I go through the Damascus Gate, I went through the Damascus Gate lots of times, and whilst it felt tense, I never saw any violence there. Instead, you go through and you can smell fresh bread, it's delicious, and you can smell spices, pick up some spices, and you, you just maybe catch a, a little glimpse of everyday life there. Because it's easy to dramatize, to think it's all violence. It's not, these are, these are traders, people walking, selling, working. Um, and this is looking back towards the Damascus Gate. And you can see there, and you see what's going on in the Damascus Gate. It's, it's a place where you can buy both relics and also stuff, um, stuff that you might need in everyday trousers or scarves or skirts or so on. If you walk down, you can come to the Via Dolorosa. And if you go on a Friday night to the Via Dolorosa, you could see people in uh, Jews uh, dressed formally going to uh, prayers at the Western Wall. You can see Muslims going to pray uh, in the Alaska Mosque. And you can see uh, Christians going towards the Holy Sepulchre Church. And they sometimes look at each other and sometimes they don't. It's not surprising that many people see Jerusalem as the center of the world. This is a 16th century picture based on uh, sort of a, a, a shamrock here. You can see Jerusalem at the top there, Europe, Asia, and Africa. You can maybe actually see a foretaste of Brexit. You can maybe just make out that England is there uh, just to the, off, off Europe, <laughs> which I only just noticed. As well. It's kind of a funny term. Um, I can't actually see Scotland because there's a bit of a disappointment there. But... Um, of course, it's not just Jerusalem at the centre, because some, some maps, um, this is a 17th century map, puts Mecca at the centre of the world. I, I'm struck by how often Jerusalem is, but this is the famous map of Mundi. You can see, there we are, you can see uh, Jerusalem, uh, well, you can just about make out Jerusalem is at the centre of the map of Mundi. And for some people, the reason for that is because um, 
of the Holy Sepulchre, because the Holy Sepulchre is the place where two, uh, many Christians believe, two very significant things happened. You've got there the site, perhaps, of the, the crucifixion and the empty tomb. You can see the Holy Sepulchre Church. The, uh, this photograph that I'm about to show you uh, demonstrates the international nature. This is a group of Russian pilgrims visiting there. But I don't want to stay in the Holy Sepulchre Church. I want to instead go travel just like uh, about 200 yards away to this church, symbol of, sort of colonial 19th century German church. It's uh, the Ch German Church of the Redeemer. And I'd like to introduce you to, if you don't already know, Bishop Munib Yonan. He's a Palestinian. Um, and the picture I'm showing you here is very historic because this is, he was the leader of the Lutheran church with the leader of the Catholic church. If you think about that in the 16th century, of course, Europe was divided by religious wars. Um, and yet here, for the first time in history since then, were uh, the, the Pope and the leader of the Lutheran uh, Federation praying together. Let's listen to uh, Bishop Munib. You have one minute, is the, far from my home is the Holy Sepulchre and my Lutheran church. Two minutes is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Haram al-Sharif. Three minutes is the Wailing Wall. So if you grow in Jerusalem, you grow in a diverse society where you think why we are different and how can we live together in our difference. And that's a question, isn't it? That's a very profound question. How do we live together in our difference? Jerusalem is a city for Christianity, Judaism and Islam, and it's dear for them. And we have to respect the historical status quo of the holy places of these faiths. Now, as he spoke, he gave me a history lesson. I found it really useful to be reminded and taught by him. He reminded me about the Balfour Declaration. So he took me back to 1917. This you can maybe just see here is the uh, only existing example of what, where it was written on a piece of notepaper from the Imperial Hotel. Um, and you'll remember what is said in the Balfour Declaration, His Majesty's Government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. That's 1917. But notice also what's said. It's often forgotten what's said. It's it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Some people argue that the first half has been followed, the second half has been ignored. That's certainly what um, Bishop Yunib told me as well. But he also, listening to him, talking to him, he reminded me not just of the Balfour Declaration. We could spend a long time talking about that. He also, uh, we talked also about uh, this, this secret correspondence uh, between the British and the Arabs, between McMahon and uh, Bin Ali, where the Arabs were promised, if they fought on the side of the British, they were promised Palestine. And then also, backstage, behind closed doors, uh, Sykes and Pico were, were promising, at the same time in the First World War, they were promising that, well, they weren't promising, they were agreeing that the Middle East would be divided between uh, France and Britain. So in other words, Britain, in a war of perceived national survival, was making three promises to the Zionists, uh, to the Arabs and to themselves of who's going to own. And of course, that was going to be impossible to deliver upon. For me, it's striking how this raises questions, not just about fighting words, about, but about scarcity, about scarce, not just texts, scarce groups or privileged groups and scarce salvation, but about scarce spaces. And it's here that, of course, you can see this because of the, the religious significance of this space, particularly the Temple Mount, Haram al-Sharif. This is a picture here you can see of Bishop Muni uh, visiting uh, the Imam of the Alaska Mosque and also the head of the Islamic Walk of um, Jerusalem as well, amongst a, a number of others. So he was visiting and he, he talked about that. And uh, on this journey, I'd like to imagine we go from the Church of uh, the Redeemer and we'll go there now. We'll, we'll visit 
this area. One of the things that strikes me when I visit there, visit there is how often it's calm and peaceful. Um, it's often represented on the news as a place of fighting, but often it, it's, it's actually quite a quiet and, and prayerful place. And then there we're going to meet um, someone from the Palestinian Ministry of Work and Religious Affairs, Salah Zuker. Um, and he, I, I never forget, he didn't want to be filmed, so this is a, a radio interview. And he said to me, when I grew up, my dad kept taking me to the mosque, to the Asker, to pray there, especially on Fridays. So in my childhood, when I got conscious about life, I got to know the Alaska. I know the mosque. So from the point of view, you can't just separate this place from your life, from your heart. So I can't see Jerusalem without the Alaska mosque. So there we are. Of course, it's, it's the mosque, but also the Dome of the Rock as well. And I want you to imagine for a moment that we are there in this compound and in front of the Dome of the Rock, and we are there going to meet uh, Mohammed al-Habash. Um, he is, um, al-Habash is, uh, he is the supreme Sharia judge in the Palestinian Authority, and he's President Mahmoud Abbas's advisor on religious and Islamic affairs. And I met him, uh, for, actually I met him for the first time in Ramallah. Notice here this phrase, we don't see Jews as enemies, the enemy is the occupation. Now, talking to him, he reminded me of some really important things that it's easy to forget about. For example, about the Oslo Peace Accords and the result there of what happened to uh, the Palestinian territories. Some people call this the Swiss cheese map because the way in which the Palestinian groups are, uh, lands are separated by settler land. He also reminded me of all the settlements and the increased number of settlers and settlements that are being established all over uh, the West Bank and occupied territories. We don't hate the Israelis, we hate the occupation. But he also emphasized again and again in the conversation, without justice, there can be no peace. There can be no peace without justice. He also reminded me how often, even though it is a place of prayer, there are demonstration fights and uh, protests around the Dome of the Rock, around the mosque. I found it interesting studying not just his uh, conversation afterwards, but also listening to his sermons afterwards. And he, the, he's very gracious in his conversation, but very different in some of his sermons, which are very determined, very robust. Here is one, for example, where he says very clearly that we cannot possibly relinquish a single millimetre, a single stone, a single micromillimetre of the al Barak wall and of the blessed Alaska mosque. Uh, and there, in the sermon, in the conversation, he reminded me why, one of the reasons why it's so significant. It's just not historical precedent, because it, but of course, it's because of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the, the night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. So there, this is the place of great significance in the same way um, that it's, it's significant uh, for millions of Muslims around, around the world. Now, below... Uh, the, the Noble Sanctuary, below the Alaska Mosque, is the Western Wall. This is from the Second Temple. If you've been there, the thing that strikes you is just how large the stones are. These are huge, coming back, of course, from the, the very bottom part, is from uh, Herod the Great's time. It's sometimes known, uh, derogatorily, it's say, as the, as the Wailing Wall, but more commonly known as the Western Wall. I'd like you to imagine there, we're going to meet someone else. This time, we're going to meet... Shlomo Moshe Amar, he's the current Sephardic chief rabbi of Jerusalem. Uh, and I had a translator when I spoke with him, he spoke in Hebrew. Um, and he gave me a history lesson about this particular area as well. He went back over 2,000 years. He, he took me uh, to, uh, this is Jerusalem, he said, the city of peace, city of prayer, city of the temple. This is the second temple, a huge, uh, some people say it's the, the wonder of the world. You can see at the centre there, uh, the Holy of Holies, a very significant uh, site. He reminded me also, uh, this is what he said, that uh, for the Lord had chosen Zion, he quoted um, the Psalms at me as well. Uh, and he pointed out how it was the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. And then he surprised me uh, in the conversation because he said, there's also a small uh, minority of Jewish extremists that go to the Temple Mount even though we've determined, according to Halakha, that this is forbidden because it's a holy place. But the Jewish extremists worry that if they do not get there and make their presence known, it will be taken from us. 
So he, he said that this is something that shouldn't be happened. He, he argued that we should be patient uh, and patient for God rather than going and doing what uh, some of the settlers are currently doing. He's argued very strongly they shouldn't be praying there and making claims upon that because it's up, up to God. Uh, he also reminded me and his uh, assistants reminded me about Yad Vashem, the memorial and museum just outside the old city uh, in Jerusalem, and they encouraged me to visit again this memorial to victims of the Holocaust. Because, of course, that's another part of the story that he was keen to remind me of to understand uh, the background. Now, this is a, a picture of one other person I'd like you to imagine. We're meeting here uh, by the Western Wall, Rabbi David Rosen. He was the chief rabbi in, uh, in Ireland for a number of years. He now lives in Jerusalem and works for a number of interfaith uh, groups. Let's listen to Rabbi David Rosen. Religion should be synonymous with building peace. Every single religion aspires for that, and therefore they should be, all religions should be in the forefront of peace building in the world. The problem is that religion is wrapped up with human identity, and when human identities are under threat, they turn to the religious resources in order to give them succor and strength, and very often manipulate them in terms of even not only providing self-justification, but of delegitimizing the other. And then religion actually, if you like, turns on itself and becomes a pathology instead of the agent of healing that it should be. But because religion relates to the deepest dimensions of our spiritual, psychological identities, it is critical for any kind of process of healing between communities in conflict. And therefore, failure on the part of pol political or diplomatic agents to engage uh, the religious dimension as a resource and its leadership as partners in that healing process is totally self-destructive and undermining their own interests. David Rosen is a passionate advocate of the importance of inter-religious dialogue. Like a number of people, he claims that one of the reasons for the failure of the Oslo Accords was because religious leaders, both the top leaders and the mid-range leaders, were not included in the conversation. He, get, he travels the world arguing that inter-religious dialogue is an essential component in facilitating peaceful reconciliation in international relations. And he claims for the uh, well-being of our world as a whole. This is him in a CC here uh, with the presidents of Israel and Palestine, uh, territory uh, Mah, uh, Abbas there, the Palestinian Authority, um, uh, leading a prayer uh, with Pope Francis. Now let's move, shall we? Let's move from uh, the Noble Sanctuary, from the Temple Mount area, to go towards another church, another historic church, the Greek Orthodox Church. And let's meet Theophilus III. He is the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem. Let's hear what he's got to say about peace. With peace, uh, we pray to God for peace. First of all, we start asking God to give us peace in order to start our prayers. And then we pray for the peace of the whole world. This is fundamental. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. This is how our liturgy starts. Yes. And then we are asking for peace of the local area, for peace of the broader area and for the peace or for the whole world. So that's uh, the leader of the Greek Orthodox Church. If you walk a few yards, you can then visit the headquarters of the Catholic Church. And here you have a chance to meet uh, the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem. Now, have a listen to, because he's putting a critique, perhaps, on all this talk about peace. Some people, you might be thinking, are you just peace-washing the situation here? Because peace can be used as a very problematic term, can't it? Because you can say, let's have peace, but if there's no justice there, then it's a way of controlling. Uh, and that's a point that came out in a number of uh, discussions. But let's just have a, a hear of... Uh, Pizzabella's reflections. I've, I don't know if I should confess here in front of the camera, but uh, uh, for a long time in my life, I was tired of this war, justice and peace. Not because I don't want justice or peace. Don't misunderstand me. I want justice and peace. I pray for this, but uh, it became a kind of a slogan. 
and also I think it was hijacked by some groups uh, in the church, in the whole society. I don't want to, I want to be associated with all these groups and so on. And now I pray in justice and peace. I pray for, for me in my heart to be just and peaceful to all people I meet. This is the first thing. I need to start for myself. And uh, to ask also my communities, now I am bishop in the communities that belong to our church, to be just and peaceful in our communities. We cannot teach others justice and peace if we don't have justice and peace in our everyday life, with the, our relation with the workers, our relations among us, with the priests, uh, with all the flock, all the different communities there, first of all, uh, to be a place where justice and peace are not just slogans that we say for others, but a life we live first in the first person. And then, uh, and then to, I pray for this. I pray uh, the Lord to to bring to to know people, people with whom we can talk and build something just uh, and uh, peaceful in the everyday relations. I don't go beyond this. So not just a slogan, and here's a challenge, isn't it? Because it's easy to talk about peace and justice, but without thinking about how is it changing the situation on the ground. Now, have you noticed, so far, all I've done is I've shown blokes, men, religious leaders, and that's, that is the reality of the situation in Jerusalem. Um, I'd like now to, with the permission of the filmmaker, to show a short clip reflecting perhaps on everyday experience from a very different perspective. I'll let you make your own judgments about this short film. بطيحوا منها على ستة ونص بطلعوا على السبعة سبعة ونص بطلعوا يوم تبكى لي يعني الجندي بكمني على البواب يوم بكى لي على التسعة على العشرة حسب مزاجي في الضائف يوم بدي أطلع مشوار بحب بحب يعني بحب أجهز حال بدي أطلع لما أطلع برا وأشوف هذا خلاص بتنكد بدي أطلع بدي أقعد على البوابة الساعة وبدي أطلع بدي أرجع وبدي شيء بدي أطلع شيء بدي أعذر شيء بدي بس الواحد يفكر فيها أيام مرتي على البوابة مرة بطوي يعني في في نبغى نحكي معهم يشوفون على الكاميرا كيف تين يفتح يعني في شيء كيف تين يفتحه في نص ساعة في ساعة في ساعتين والفترة في الشتاء قعدنا 12 يوم قلت لما أعبر وسد وراي بحس حالي عبرت على وين عسجل المدرسة منيحة أنا بحب أدرس فيها أني وحيدة البوابة بتبعدني عن كل الأشياء اللي بحبها. تعال الجدار عشان يعني بلف من هنا على الكرسي عشان لدي ولا مكان جدار هذا مش بس يعني على البلد هاي. عشان يفصلوا يفصلوا البلد عن المستوطنات بعدها. بت والله بيجي هاي مبروك وبيجوا هاي وح وبطلع بطرح طرنا بيجوا بيجوا شمت هوا بيجوا معي شمت هوا وشي. نحن نقعد نتفرج عليهم يعني بنقول يعني هاي مهمة إلهم حريتهم نحن مش معطينا حرية ما نهم مخذي حريتهم uh, And I was reminded both by Palestinian and Jewish journalists of the reality uh, of this the, the separation barrier as it's known and lots of different uh, and that's, that's a reality I was also encouraged to go through checkpoints to experience what it's like to go through a checkpoint and have to wait for two or three hours in order to get to work each morning. I was also reminded uh, by uh, the journalists, but also by the religious leaders of a visit, a visit by Pope Francis just before COVID time, 
Uh, he visited a number of places. This is actually visiting the death wall in Auschwitz. This, and praying there in silence. This is him visiting the Western Wall uh, in Jerusalem. And this is him stopping unexpectedly, unplanned, uh, just outside Bethlehem at the separation barrier uh, there and praying there. Uh, this is not the Pope walking over the wall, just if you're wondering what's happened, it's just a photograph. But I like the quote, you show me a 50-foot wall and I'll show you a 51-foot ladder. Uh, now, I think I am going to show this. I've been debating whether to show this clip because it's slightly off topic, but it's by a filmmaker who thought that you might enjoy seeing it. So see what you think, and it, it does reflect on the barrier as well. It is actually on topic, uh, but it takes us outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, uh, has many walls in, just outside. A wall represents a failure of politics. Um, you can't love your neighbor if you can't see them, if you can't talk to them. A lady who brings down walls um, is probably my most famous work. By putting an icon, something of incredible beauty, onto something which is itself so ugly, it's a way to challenge it and to break it. It's invoking the powers of heaven, the powers of reconciliation, the powers of love, into a chasm of despair and hopelessness. A lot of people just don't understand and, and feel frustrated at the inhumanity that they see, and they don't know what to do. So they come to this image and pray, and they just pray that somehow all these walls that people have built can, can crumble, can fade away, and something beautiful can be reborn. Bethlehem is the town of birth, of rebirth. And here it's the wall just positioned on the edge of Bethlehem and the edge of Jerusalem. So it's this, this sort of transition point where you've got all this despair, but then also this hope breaking through. Of course, this is a famous picture of another artist, Banksy, who painted on the, the uh, wall a view to a piece. Uh, that's the claim it was by Banksy. Some people say there's a famous story of, uh, of him painting there and somebody coming and saying, 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 how dare you make this ugly thing beautiful? You shouldn't be painting it. We hate this wall. So there, there's a question to reflect on. Now, you may be feeling a little like this at this moment. We're back in the old city, a little bit tired, in need of lunch or a break, because I know this has been fast and intense. I really like this picture. Right? Um, and so we're going to go to a place called the Austrian Hospice, um, which is actually, amongst other things, a cafe. And I want you to imagine that we're going to sit there, and you can have what you like. I'll buy you know, coffee, lunch. You know, you, we'll have a, we're going to have a chat now about... We've done a very quick walk around the old city, and we're going to have a few books that I'm going to bring out, and we'll talk about those, and then we can reflect on. And so the, the, the first book, this is uh, The Moral Imagination by John Paul Lederach. John Paul Lederach is one of the leaders in the field of peace building and religious peace building. And he talks very persuasively about the importance of stepping empathetically into the world of the other. The moral imagination for him requires the capacity to imagine ourselves in a web of relationships that includes our enemies, the ability to sustain a paradoxical, oh, curiosity, that embraces complexity without reliance on dualistic polarity. There's quite a lot in that, uh, and we could spend a whole hour reflecting on it, but I think the point is it's, it's stepping into these relationships with people perhaps we, we really dislike or hate or disagree with, but also not going towards Julas, it going to the, between them and us. So this is worth reflecting on, 
um, in terms of how we explore this ongoing, intractable, apparently intractable conflict. I've been reading a lot of both Palestinian and Israeli authors. Uh, one, for example, Amos Oz, A Tale of Love and Darkness. Listen to, uh, and this is a book we're going to have at the table. We can maybe read one or two extracts out of. Out there in the world, all the worlds were covered with graffiti. Yids go back to Jeru Palestine. So we came back to Palestine. And now the world at large shouts to us, Yids get out of Palestine. He also wrote, memorably, this city, this is Jerusalem, so much has happened here. This city has been destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt again. Conqueror after conqueror has come, ruled for a while, left behind a few walls and towers, some cracks in the stone, a handful of potsherds and documents and disappeared, vanished like the morning mist down the hilly slopes, offering the historical perspective on this city. So that's Amos Oz. Uh, he has very vivid memories of there, being there as a child and returning as an adult. Now let's listen to a Palestinian author. Uh, I saw Ramallah, who was 30 years away uh, from, and then returned. And I'm going to read this out because it stayed with me, this quote. So imagine you're just eating your, your strudel or you're having your coffee as I read it. All that the world knows of Jerusalem is the power of the symbol. The dome of the rock is what the eyes see. And so it sees Jerusalem and is satisfied. The Jerusalem of religions, the Jerusalem of politics, the Jerusalem of conflict in, is the Jerusalem of the world. But the world does not care for our Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of the people, the Jerusalem of houses and cobbled streets and spice markets, the terminals of the buses that trundle in every morning from all the villages with peasants come to buy and to sell, the Jerusalem of the white cheese, of oil and olives and thyme, of baskets of figs and necklaces and leather and Saladin Street, our neighbour the nun and her neighbour, the muhazen, who was always in a hurry. This for me, brings us back, doesn't it, to walking through. This is an everyday city where people live um, and, and love and die. Um, so let's go back to the Damascus Gate. Let's return uh, as we begin to finish this journey, perhaps uh, as if for the first time we return to it. And there we'll meet. We'll meet um, a friend, Tron Bekovic. He's worked for 30 or 40 years in Jerusalem as a peace builder, working with religious leaders uh, from all sides of the conflict. He's written this diary in Norwegian. I don't speak Norwegian either, uh, but he, he gave me an English summary of the key of it. And he, he argues that religious dialogue can clear the way for political decisions. He makes a passionate case for the importance of interreligious dialogue uh, as part of what's uh, of, of fixing, uh, not fixing, but helping to try and repair the situation. But when I listened to him, I was struck by uh, not Jerusalem for a moment, but uh, just outside Edinburgh. This is the third, fourth bridge, and it has taken millions and millions and millions of pounds to build and years to make. Bridge building is a very difficult exercise, even uh, when you're making a real bridge, let alone uh, between communities, uh, divided communities. And that becomes very apparent. We're still, by the way, um, at Damascus Gate, not thinking about bridges, but perhaps there's one other book uh, that we brought out and this is, uh, I mentioned it earlier by Mark Gopin on holy war, holy peace. He argues that religion really can contribute to peace building. It doesn't necessarily have to drive towards violence. And it can lead towards emphasis upon justice, remorse for all the trauma that's been, and also forgiveness, but not a cheap kind of forgiveness. He argues for a separate, alongside political track, also a religious track, a parallel to the political one that focuses on religion, culture, symbolic gestures, moral commitments, justice, and transformations of relationships. Now, that may sound all a bit dense. He's, he's a rabbi who's worked a lot with different groups. But I think it is, it's persuasive when you think about how some people suggest that religious involvement of religious leaders has actually de-escalated some of the conflict at times. Not always, but sometimes. For example, I think of the Bereaved Families Forum, who uh, created a, a display with dozens of coffins. And the coffins were covered by Palestinian flags and Israeli flags. And they were placed uh, as a memorial to all those killed during the Second Intifada. And the, above was this quote, better have the pains of peace than the agonies of war. 
a quote that uh, I think goes back to Begin, but has been used in different contexts. So the bereaved families forum, drawing back together, um, emphasizing that in a way, in a conflict, uh, there potentially are, are no winners but many losers. A number of people have talked about the importance perhaps of developing hierarchies of holiness. In other words, you can have holy places, but more important, surely, is places that <coughs> sanctify human lives above the holy land and holy places. So it's worth thinking about that further, isn't it? Thinking about, are there things that are more important than the land? I have a friend who says, very simply, it would be sold if the land was given back. But, but then they stopped and said, well, is that true? This is a Muslim scholar who said, but maybe there's been such history of hurt, there also needs to be other kinds of healing and restoration as well. You'll notice on this journey, we've met a number of uh, religious leaders, but we were also confronted by the story of that young girl whose story has stayed with me because it's a story of constraint and of hurt as well. But it, part of why I put this slide up uh, as we're finishing this journey is to think about the next generation as well. Many of the religious leaders are, how should we say, are, are mature, are older, but it's about thinking about the next generation. Will there be a time when both sides will say simply, we cannot have the kind of fighting that goes on. We need to work towards a just peace. I believe it's important to finish things, not perhaps with despair and agony, but with something more hopeful. And so perhaps I'd like to uh, finish with this image. This is just outside the old city in Jerusalem. And you can maybe see this tree of hope. It's in a hospital. And can you make out, it's not leaves, but these are swallows. And the great thing, of course, about swallows is what they do is they're not constrained by barriers or walls, but they can fly above them. So in many ways, what I've been trying to argue is for the vitality and the vitalness of religious peace building, of not leaving religion out of the peace building uh, process. I've been arguing for the importance of bearing witness for the injustice and the trauma that has gone on and the injustice that is going on at this time. And I've been arguing for the importance of searching for the truth because there's a lot of distortion of truth what, of what is happening at the moment. Uh, but also to think very hopefully about this tree of hope because I think it's vital to hold on to hope in this situation. Um, and I believe that many of the people we've met do hold out not encouragements towards violence, but towards a difficult road towards a just peace. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for an uh, absolutely fantastic lecture. I really enjoyed it. Can I, um, can I just present you with uh, a problem, as I see it, sitting in the West and watching this stunning countryside, wonderful people, when um, we have a, a move in Israel where a move dramatically to the right and a huge threat, I would argue, to the people who have you've demonstrated and who show great optimism and the tree of hope. How do, how do they live through an escalating threat rather than one which they feel that they ought to have by now have made some contribution to? Recently, uh, two weeks ago, I met a, a settler and I don't want to platform or celebrate that, but it struck me as he said, his experience of meeting Palestinians had changed his mind. And he now argues passionately that it is an occupation. This is a settler who's saying this is an occupation and it's wrong and we need to stop it. So even within some of the, uh, as you described, sort of right-wing groups, there are internal dialogues and critiques of the situation as well. So for, and what struck me about listening to this, this settler is that he was theologically driven. It was a theological vision so he still believes that God gave the land uh, to the Jews, and yet he's also saying what's happened is, te is unjust. So I, I, was, I was confused. He said, the more I speak, the less popular I become in my own community. 
and he was speaking uh, with a Palestinian who was also speaking publicly. And, he, and the Palestinian was saying, I also completely disagree with the settlements. I completely disagree with what's happening. And yet, I think it's vital that we talk to the settlers. And yet he is hated by his community as well. He's it's vilified by his, for normalizing the situation. So there, um, you can see the difficulties of peace building. So I think your, your question is absolutely spot on because it's actually very difficult to articulate now, for example, in the Israeli side, if you like, a, a more pro uh, two-state solution because of the move to the right. Because it's a very difficult, dangerous place to be because you're arguing against the move of society. So I, I think you're spot on. It's, in a way, I think it perhaps being hopeful is also being realistic. It's difficult. Lord um, Peter Ricketts, who spoke uh, at one of the Gresham lectures recently uh, on British foreign policy since the war, was emphasising how important it was to have dialogue with your enemies. Yeah. With no dialogue, you have no diplomacy. And um, sustaining that is critical. I think you've made that point very clearly. So any questions from the audience, please? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I belong to the interfaith in Milton Keynes, and so I'm quite familiar with some of your ideas, but they were beautifully expressed. Can I just uh, say something? You, you talked about the two-state solution. Now, that's not worked. Don't you think? one should work for a one-state solution where there'll be equality between all communities in a second <coughs> state. I think I want to underline here what I said at the beginning, that I am a guest and a learner, and I hesitate to make a, a, a statement about political science and the political realities. However, I am going to say, because you asked a question, I want to honour your question. So do hear, I'm trying to just be realistic that I am no expert here. But you're, you're right, the two-state solution is, is not working at the moment. Is there a more just way? I mean, I mean let's talk about Jerusalem specifically. Uh, I was actually just reading a really interesting account today. It was arguing that if only Jerusalem could be shared, not seen as a scarce thing, but shared generously, so if you see as one Jerusalem, not east-west Jerusalem, not Jerusalem owned by the Jews or by the Muslims, but something that is shared, then that would be, the argument was, that would be honouring to God for both uh, Jews and Muslims. So I'd say perhaps one Jerusalem. I'm hesitant to say one state because the danger is the power relations currently are so unfair that if you have a one-state solution, then the superpower will be able to exert their will on the less powerful. So I suppose that's my hesitation. Uh, and again, I'd want to hear not just, I, I mean, I left out a lot of voices here. You can imagine there were lots of other people we, we could have heard from. But many still hold on to a hope for a two-state solution. But they're beginning to wonder whether, how realistic that is. So thank you for that important question. So this is a lot of America in all this that I find puzzling. There are roughly five, or is it seven million Jews in America? Uh, and a good 300 million or more Gentiles, and yet um, the role of America seems so uh, considerable. Uh, how, does, how do the Gentiles of America explain to themselves the enormous um, assistance and involvement that, their state, that the American state has in the Middle East? How does it serve the Gentiles uh, of America to have this involvement that America has in the Middle East? It's puzzling to me why they are allowed to go on. Again, I'm not an American uh, expert. Uh, what strikes me is uh, listening to a number of American scholars who've done a lot of work on Zionism in uh, the, the USA and why certain groups, particularly conservative Christian groups, are drawn towards very strong articulations of Zionist positions. And that they've often pointed me to thinking historically about that, to think back not just to now, but to the 19th century and even earlier as well, to, to belief that it's vital uh, for uh, Christianity uh, that there is a strong Jewish presence. And you can see that it, it also affecting arguably uh, British foreign policy as well. However, that's only one group within a very diverse American society. So I think it's a fair question to wonder why is there support for uh, Israel across the states? And I would hesitate to make a, a, a blanket uh, observation, but nevertheless, I think there are some American scholars who pointed to the fact that the belief is that Israel provides both politically and religiously almost like a safe space 
for American interests to be in the Middle East. So that's, that's another position. Do you, do you see what I mean? In terms of it will provide uh, a secure base because there's not threat to the Christian churches in the way that there are in, perhaps in other nations. Uh, thank you. Um, if we were here 100 years ago, um, I guess the tree of hope or the sort of utopia was United Nations um, because there was a recognition, I, su I suppose, that justice at the end of the day and in the end, who is the arbiter of, 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 of making decisions such as the irreconcilable decision in, in, in Israel-Palestine. And I guess my question is, unless one gets um, an acceptance of a body that is the arbiter of what is right and what is wrong, you can have any number of religious factions and zealots that you, you, you wish for, uh, it will not be reconciled unless somebody accepts that you need to make a decision on justice. And it's interesting that we're in here in the you know, courts of law and temples. So I, I just wonder how, how, how you see that being resolved. For me, that's an important point because it raises for me questions about different levels of peace building. So you have the elite sort of top level, uh, and that's obviously very important. And you could say, well, to your question, it's vital that there's a just a League of Nations, a, a United Nations, which actually would be able to exert some, some control. But you, could see, you can see a, something flying around the room there, sort of imaginatively, hopefully. You think, well, that that's, hasn't worked. How on earth is that going to work? Then I think it's worth thinking about mid-level and grassroots peace, peace building. You've got mid-level that often is left out, which might be uh, religious leaders, which I, I think sometimes you can see. If you look at history of peace building, uh, of conflicts that seem so intractable, sometimes the real lasting peace emerges not necessarily from the elite, but from mid-range and grassroots. So if you think about grassroots, people saying, this has got to stop. At the moment, that's not happening because both grassroots are saying this has got to change and the way we change it is through uh, the myth of redemptive violence. We do it through violence. Uh, or Many people are saying that. But if there was a significant workplace, a massive change towards saying and the grassroots, then you'd hope, you'd hope that there might be a change at the top range or, or mid range. Uh, but thank you. I think that, that those are worth, I mean, it's, it's complex, but again, I, I think it actually strengthens what I'm trying to argue here is the vital importance of involving religious leaders, not just in the elite conversations, but also in the acts of mid-range and, and grassroots levels as well. Julian, the, the, the Lucy Lyons film is, is so graphic about um, the impact, the inhuman aspect of imprisonment, if you like, and the the imposition of somebody else's will on individuals who don't have the power to alter what's happening around them. That one wonders how your group of religious leaders who are very articulate and very clearly make a statement, how they can actually influence something which is locking away significant proportions of the population, irrespective of where they are in the world, for example. Many other examples one could choose, but just take that film, that poor little girl queuing up to do something important to her and her family maybe separated from our olive trees, who knows? But how can the religious leaders impact, in a practical sense, what is being done to that little girl in the next six years of her life? I mean, I think sometimes uh, they can't. They actually recognise their powerlessness. They can't do anything. They can do practical things in terms of food, or, but in terms of policy, they can't. But maybe that, that sense is that sort of the local leaders, what I've noticed is, they would put an emphasis of not sorry, sort of doing two, fixing things, but being with in the first instance, of being alongside and bearing witness to what's happening in the hope that it might change. Because the thing that struck me again and again by these religious leaders is you sort of felt that they wanted to have a magic wand to sort things out their way, but they realised they didn't, they couldn't, they wouldn't, it wasn't possible. So then you're pushed back to, well, if you can't change it, what do you do with it? Do you give up and despair? Do you blow all the candles out and just say, well, we live in the darkness, or do we light a candle and say, well, let's try and do something small here? So some of the, I mean, even the symbolic acts of stopping Pope Francis, for example, stopping by a barrier and praying against it, even though it wasn't on the schedule. And you can see those symbolic moments are, are significant. However, some of, some of these religious leaders, I'm very aware that I've selected more, inverted commas, 
peaceful articulations, some of them I could also present where actually they could be seen as pushing people towards violence as well. So there is, you remember this phrase of the ambivalence of the sacred. There is an ambivalence of the sacred here. I don't want to turn this all, relig all the religious leaders and groups into these sort of saintly figures who are pushing peace all the time. They may not be, uh, and there is an ambivalence of the sacred. Thank you very much. It was, um, I was struck one point in, in your talk by a message that I took from it myself, which was that basically there's only one behaviour you can change, and that's your own. And um, maybe that's the message we should take away today, that we have to behave well and look after other people, and then perhaps we can avoid some of these things with the help of our religious leaders. Mm -hmm. Jolly and Mitchell, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture, a very stimulating conversation. <laughs>